Well, the pandemic has changed a lot of things in our world. Many industries, different economies were severely affected by the pandemic. One of those industries was actually the, the airline industry, which seems relatively obvious. Not too many people were flying uh, too often during uh, the pandemic. And I was actually reading this thing that said that during um, 2020, that the airline industries lost like $84 billion within 2020, which kind of blew my mind. I had to do a little double take. Like, is that a B or is that an M? And it was a B. And I was like, $84 billion, that seems like a lot of money for those airline industry people. But as a consumer, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't too, too bad because the classic economics is supply and demand, supply and demand. And so I don't know if you ever took a flight uh, during, uh, during somewhat the pandemic uh, season. Uh, you noticed that the flights were, were a lot cheaper. Uh, when you got onto the flight, there was no one sitting in the middle seat anymore. You had aisle, you had window, you had whichever seats you wanted in the plane. I remember, I think one plane I went on, it was like I, I, 10 people or something like that. I mean, you, you could have the whole plane to yourself. It's like a private jet straight up to, to, to sign up and to get a ticket to fly across the country for a very discounted uh, price. And so, uh, Karina and I, we actually took a trip up to, uh, to Idaho earlier this year uh, just to visit some friends and to see the church up there. And uh, we were... Um, we, we got some, we got some, some tickets at, at a pretty good price. And during uh, COVID, there was a lot of uh, cancellations, a lot of changes with flights because, again, supply and demand. We're not going to fly an empty plane to this city if no one's going to be on it. Um, and so there are lots of changes with flights. And so Karina and I, we were on our way to John Wayne. We were pulling up to the terminal. And uh, I get to, the, to John Wayne, especially it, it was earlier this year. I, you don't need to get there that early. I mean, I'm not my dad. My dad would get there like five, six, seven, eight, 24 hours early before before his plane takes off. So I don't do that. I'm pretty normal in terms of hour, two hours, somewhere in that range. And so I showed up with a reasonable amount of time. We were pulling up to the airport and I told Karina, I was like, what time, uh, you know, is our flight? She's like, oh, it says uh, 1.15. And I was like, I, I don't remember 1.15. I thought it was like 1.30. And she was like, no, it's, look, on the ticket, it's 1.15 on the boarding pass. And I was like, okay, let me double check mine. And it was 1.30. And I was like, oh, this, this is a problem. Um, and I was like, what, what gate is your, your plane taking off of? And she's like, B10 or whatever it was. And I was like, oh, I'm taking off on B12. Nah, this seems not good. I was like, what city are you going to? And she's like, Oakland. And I was like, oh, that's, that's a bummer because I'm going to Denver. <laughs> so uh, we've, we've got a problem here. And so, again, we are in the terminal, like, figuring out which gate to drop, uh, like, for us to get dropped off on when I found out we were going different places, going on, hopping on different flights. And so Karina was pregnant, and she was one of those pregnant women that was not sick through the first trimester or second trimester. She was the one that was, like, throwing up all the way through labor. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that my pregnant wife was not going to Oakland by herself. I mean, just the airport, so not Oakland, Oakland, but the airport. I was like, I don't want to do that to my wife. And so, again, the, the people working, they were too reflexible with us. They got us on the same flight. And we went wherever we went. I think it was Oakland, I guess. Didn't matter because we were going to Idaho. And, and we got to be on the same flight. But I learned a valuable lesson that day that you probably only have to learn once. Is when you're on your way to the airport, especially when you're on your way to the airport, you got to make sure that you double check your ticket. And you got to make sure that you double check every ticket in your party to make sure that you guys are on the same flight. The, the plane takes off at the same time and the plane actually who takes you to the right place that you're trying to go. I learned my lesson, and thankfully, I think I'm only going to have to learn it once. Every time I go to John Wayne, I will triple check those tickets, every one of our tickets, to make sure we're going to the same place, because I don't want that to happen again. We showed up to the airport unprepared. We showed up mindless, and it almost cost us. You see, I fear that that oftentimes happen, happens on your way to church. See, it's one thing for it to happen at the airport. You've got people at the terminal to fix your, you know, flight situations, get you on the right flight at the right time where you need to go. But church, it's, it's, it's a much bigger deal. And my fear is that oftentimes we show up to church unprepared, not ready to, to, to show up, to sit before uh, the, the feet of God's word and to learn what God has us to, what, what God has us to, to learn, but then also what God has us to do. And see, if we show up to church unprepared, if we show up mindless like I did on the way to the airport, that could be much more costly than missing a flight at John Wayne. You see, when we show up to church, it is so important that we show up with the right mindset. We show up with the right readiness. We don't show up mindless. We show up ready to go. You see, I know how it is. You know, kids are making you late, and we get in the car, and mom and dad are yelling at the kids for making us late, and, and the car ride is awful, and by the time you open up the door, everyone's all righteous and holy. By the time the door is open in the parking lot, you see the parking guys, you wave at them, you smile, everyone's happy. But I know that that unpreparedness, 
not being ready, showing up mindlessly to church can actually have costly effects, especially when we sit here and we worship God together, and then especially when we sit behind God's word, or we sit at the feet of God's word, learning what God would have us to do. Because therefore, if we don't show up ready, then we are not going to respond the way God wants us to respond. That's a big, big deal. So I want us to turn to James chapter 1 this morning, a familiar text, one that I'm sure you know, maybe you even have memorized. A reminder for us to respond rightly to God's word. And that's not just something that we can, you know, just try to do a little bit better, try to, try, try to work a little harder. But I think that it's important for us to do it this weekend. You see, last weekend, Pastor Elliot, he was uh, finishing up our series through the book of Colossians. We finished all four chapters of Colossians. Next week, he's starting the book of Romans. I do not know how long we're going to be in the book of Romans, but I'm sure it's going to be a while, and it's going to be an awesome series. And so right here, we're in the middle of these two Sundays, well, looking back on one full series, and then we're looking forward to another series. And I think it's an important reminder for us today from the book of James, a familiar text, to remind us to look in the mirror, to make sure that we are ready, make sure that we are hearing God's word the way that we're supposed to, and making sure that we're responding to God's word the way that we're supposed to as well. So I trust that it will be a helpful, somewhat convicting reminder of even the way that we show up to church and sit under the teaching of God's word. So let's open up James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25. Let's read these verses together. James 1, verse 22, it says, But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, and he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, be no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. See, James chapter 1, James, he kind of does go all over the place. One commentator said James is kind of like a pastoral blog where he just kind of hits on a lot of different topics, but he's coming off a, a conversation about putting sin to death, putting away all filthiness, putting away all anger, and he's saying the only way that you can do that, verse 21, is receive the implanted word, which has power to save your souls. And he says the only way that that's able to happen in your life is if you don't just hear God's word, but you're actively putting it into practice. See, I think it's an important reminder for us as we look back on the book of Colossians, we look forward to, to a series through the book of Romans, that we make sure that we are doers of the word. If not, we're just, we're, we're, we're somewhat, not fully wasting, but wasting a, a great opportunity that we have every weekend to sit under good Bible teaching. Not tickling of ears, not seeker sensitive, but what does God's word say? We have an incredible privilege to hear that every single week, we got to make sure that we are not just sitting here, just spectating from the sidelines, but we're actively engaged, not only our ears, but then also our legs when we're going out Sunday afternoon, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, throughout the rest of the week, throughout the rest of the month, throughout the rest of the year, to actually be doers of God's word. We don't want to be spectators. You can write it down this way for point number one. James warns us of doing this. Point number one, avoid being a Bible spectator. Avoid being a Bible spectator. Starts off here, he says, be, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Why? Because you deceive yourself, he says. See, someone sitting under good Bible teaching a lot, you can grow comfortable in it. And comfortability, it always will breed laziness. See, in college, I worked in the insurance world a little bit. And I will tell you what, the, the worst demographic in the world for insurance is 16-year-old male drivers. Like, they've got the highest uh, premiums because, man, they're, they're risky, at least in the eyes of the underwriters of insurance companies. And they look at 16-year-old, they say, that guy's going to crash a car. I know he is. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's reckless. He's probably distracted. You see, I was a 16-year-old male at one time. I'm still male, but I was 16 years old one time, and I remember getting my license when I turned 16. And what did I do? What did all of us do? We were at 10 and 2 all the time. Don't you remember that? Your driver's test, that might have been the last time you were at 10 and 2. Right now, because you're up at 12, you've got coffee in your hand, you're changing the radio, you're yelling at your kids behind you. Like, we're, when we drive, we get distracted. And so insurance is not just for 16-year-old males. Insurance is for 20-year-old, 30-year-old, 40-year-old, 50-year-old, 60-year-old, 70-year-old men and women. Why? Because comfortability, it always breeds laziness. And when we grow comfortable, that, that, that's when we can start to, to fall down a, a dangerous path, to fall down dangerous habits here. And so coming to a good church, that is a great thing. Hearing good Bible teaching, that is an awesome thing, a gift from God. But if you're comfortable in it, if you just show up and it's just a check-the-box mentality, you're going to get nowhere. You're going to leave so much on the, on the cutting room floor. 
If we're not actively hearing and doing, he says, "Don't be a," do, or he says, "Be a doer and not a hearer only." For you deceive yourself. He he creates the the emphasis of why this is so important because hearers at good Bible teaching churches they show up and they are just hearers and they deceive themselves, thinking they are okay, but they're just hearers. Turn over to Matthew chapter seven. Matthew chapter seven at the end of a perhaps the most famous sermon of all time. Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Lots of awesome stuff in this sermon. And he ends with a call and response. He says, don't just hear, but also do. And we've got this familiar illustration here of a man building a house on a rock and a man building a house upon the sand. Look at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7. Look at verse 24. Jesus is serious about hearing and doing. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them, is a doer of the word. He's like a wise man who builds his house upon the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, just a hearer of the word, he's like a foolish man building his house upon the sand. Rains fell, the floods came, the winds blew, beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Jesus, he was teaching his disciples, he was teaching his Pharisees, he was teaching the crowds of how to be a righteous person, how to make sure that you are fully obeying the law of God. He corrects some bad theology in here, he corrects some excuses here in this section, and he says, you need to make sure that you don't just hear and walk away and forget by lunchtime on Sunday when you flip on the football game later this afternoon. We build a house upon the rock, we hear and then we do here is our self-deceived. Look up at the paragraph just above it. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Another familiar text. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out many demons in your name? Did we not do many mighty works in your name? Did we not go to a good Bible teaching church? Did we not hear lots of good sermons? Aren't we really theologically smart? Aren't we people that read our Bibles every day? Verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Self-deceived hearers, Jesus says, self-deceived, self-deceived hearers go to hell. That's what, why this is such an important thing, that we make sure that we respond to God's word the way that he calls us to. I mean, I, I, this text, you, you can't read it without having some trepidation when you approach it. Wow, wow. People going up to, no, I, I, I knew you. Look at all the things that I've done. Look at my spiritual resume. Look at where I went to church. Look at, I serve. Look at, I know all these theological things. He says, depart from me. I never knew you workers of lawlessness. Why? Because they believe good things? Because they go to good churches? Because they serve? No, he says, verse 21, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. It's like the wise man, verse 24, who builds his house upon the rock, hearing the words and then doing the words. We got to make sure that our, uh, remember that our proximity to godliness, our proximity to holiness does not in and of itself equal holiness. So being in a good small group, being in a good church, that does not necessarily equal holiness for you. There's this aspect of you hearing, you doing, you participating, not just by serving and checking a box, but making sure that we are responding to God's word, responding to the conviction, the godly grief that you feel. 2 Corinthians 7, for godly grief, it produces repentance that leads to life, hearing and doing, creating a high expectation for it. Hopefully you're reading through the Bible with us, but I thought, how timely this morning of all chapters in the Bible, this morning in our EDW, Ezekiel. We think Ezekiel, like, oh, what, what, do, I know a bit, uh, what do I know about Ezekiel? Uh, we all know Ezekiel 36. That was our reading today. Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27, the promise of the new covenant. This is what God says. He says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and to be careful to obey my rules. We see this aspect of sanctification and justification. God justifying us, declaring us righteous in his sight only through repenting of our sins, placing our faith in Jesus' perfection can we be made right in God's eyes. That is nothing of our own doing. By grace we're saved through faith, not of our own works, so that no one may boast. Ephesians 2.8, 
He justifies us, giving us the Spirit, but then also now the Spirit is within us, causing us to walk in my statutes, careful to obey my rules. That's sanctification, this process of becoming more holy, the process of maturing in godliness, going up and up and up, maturing more and more and more, bearing more and more fruit. That is a doer of the Word. When the word doesn't penetrate your heart and it doesn't increase or it doesn't uh, result in increased holiness, then we've got a problem, is what the Bible says. You look around people, maybe in your small group, people at this church, you're like, man, they're growing. They're growing. I remember as a freshman in high school looking around at at my high school group and I I watched everyone. I watched them grow. I watched how passionate and how how ambitious they were for the gospel. I looked around and I said, wow, they actually want to go to church. Wow, they actually want to sit under God's word. Wow, they actually want to read their Bibles, put it into practice in their life. I remember as a freshman in high school, I looked around and I saw everyone else was growing except for me. I was like, something's wrong. Something's wrong because I, I noticed I still have that heart of stone when I was a freshman. Falling to my knees, asking God for forgiveness, repenting of my sins, placing my faith in Christ. And then that spirit was introduced in my life. That I was able to walk in statutes, that I was able to grow. We see this passivity and this forgetfulness of this here back in James 1. Uh, Back in verse 23, he gives this illustration of this guy who looks in a mirror. Passive, forgetful. Verse 23, James 1. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. This forgetful hearer that shows up on a Sunday morning, maybe opens up their Bible on a regular basis, closes it and forgets about it. And he's saying, that's a, that's a big deal. Forgetting is a big deal. See, in our world, forgetting things is typically not a big deal. I mean, you tell your kids to, to learn their multiplication table, but guess what? When you graduate, you can, you can use a calculator. We all have those. You can use this amazing gift of God called Google, and it it's got, gives you most answers of pretty much anything. I remember being that, that, that kid, every time I would go on vacation, you know that feeling, the pit in your stomach when you drive out of the driveway and you're like, I forgot something? Like that happens to all of us. Every time I go on vacation, I feel like I forget something. I remember my dad would always say, as we're driving out of the driveway, he'd say, if you forgot, it, if you forgot anything, if you can remember it now, go get it. But if not, it's okay. Because wherever we're going, as long as it's America, they've got, they've got Target. So if you forget your deodorant, we can go to Target. If you forget your toothbrush, we can go to Target. If you forget your charging cord, we can go to Target. It's okay. Now, I would like you to remember. That'd be great. But if not, we've got Target. It's fine. And so forgetting for us is it's not a huge deal in most cases. I mean, you can forget and remember later and it's okay. But when it comes to God's word, he's creating this high expectation for forgetting God's word. <laughs> this illustration here, he, I mean, this guy, we're supposed to read it and, wow, and think, wow, what a stupid guy here. He looks at his face in a mirror and he goes away and forgets what he was once like. The, the picture of the mirror is a great picture, great illustration of the word. Because when we open up God's word, it's like a mirror into our life. And we, we look and we're like, wow, man, I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Man, I need to be doing this. I'm convicted about that. Every time you show up to church on Sunday, I'm sure you leave with some semblance of conviction, some semblance of maybe some encouragement too, to I need to go do this. See, I, I'm normally with the junior high and high school students, and so we have to talk about this maybe a little bit more than we do, but I, I try to encourage them, you, before you go to school, before you go to church, make sure you just look in the mirror, like at least one time, right? Just look in the mirror. And so most of you, I can tell you, you looked in the mirror this morning, and that's great. And every time you wake up, you look in the mirror, you see some stuff that's wrong, right? Every time you see the eye boogers, you see your hair's all messed up, maybe you got to throw some makeup on, something like that. You look in the mirror, you say, wow, that doesn't look good. I need to do this. And there's a very tangible solution. It's a hairbrush. It's whatever, your makeup bag or whatever it is. When we go to God's word, it's like that mirror. It shows us what's going on. It shows us our sinfulness, but then it also shows us a remedy for our sinfulness in the cross of Jesus Christ. And therefore, we look into it and we walk away. It's like you showing up to church without doing your hair. It's like you showing up to church without, you know, your pajamas on or whatever. Looking into mirror should always cause a result. It should always impact something. And so when we look into the mirror of God's word, it should impact. We, we have a, a high view of the Bible because we believe it's God's word. 
uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. What does it say? The word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Every time we open up the mirror, that's what we're opening up. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scriptures breathe out by God, profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so the man of God will be equipped, ready for every good work. Every time we open up the mirror, that's what we're opening up. This breathed out by God, uh, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the vision of soul and spirit, joints and of marrow. That's what we open up. And therefore, we can't just look at it and say, oh, I'm going to go to church and my hair's going to be messed up and oh, I'm going to look terrible. No, we, we, we see it. We see the problem. We see the solution in Christ. And then we respond to it. It'd be so easy for us to just be comfortable in being hearers of the word. See, the incredible thing about God's word is not only is the mirror convicting, but the mirror also gives us that solution, right? Pastor Eli preaches a sermon. You say, wow, you write down some notes. You're like, man, I, I'm not sharing the gospel. I need to share the gospel this week. You, you start to think, okay, well, I'm going to uh, try to find an opportunity or try to do this, try to do that. Well, have you ever tried on your own strength? How does that work? Does it work out very well? Do you get past lunch on Sunday of trying to apply God's word? No, you don't, because you need the, the power of the Holy Spirit, Ezekiel 36, putting the Spirit within you, causing you to walk in his statutes. There's this aspect of you working, but then also Christ doing the work inside of you, this transforming grace. See, grace is this incredible, incredible gift from God, and grace that not only forgives you, it not only saves you from sin, but then also graces this incredible gift that God now gives you as the, the power, the battery to actually do something, to actually apply his word, to actually be a doer of God's word. And see, when we come to church, it matters the way that we hear. You can't even be a doer unless you're a good hearer. And that's why we encourage note-taking. That's why we throw points on the screen because we want to help you as much as we possibly can so that you can know what to do. The, the, the purpose, the, the application, what can I do? To give you a little behind the scenes, break the fourth wall a little bit, I'll tell you just in my numerous hours of conversations with Pastor Ellie, I can tell you this, he did not tell me to say this at all, but I will tell you this, he loves his sheep. He loves his sheep so much. He loves you so much. He prays for you. He's like Epaphras in Colossians 4 last week, agonizing on your behalf in his prayers. I've seen it. I know his, his heart for you. He cares for you. And I know part of the way that he cares for you is through the Sunday morning sermons. And how many conversations I've had with him where he's like, man, I'm just praying that the church would, would hear this sermon and that they would do something about it. Not in a frustrating way, but in, well, maybe sometimes, but most of the time, oh, man, I just, I'm so burdened for them. I love them so much if they would just do this. I remember going through Colossians, through that section at the end of chapter three with the, uh, um, the family section, the husbands, wives, parents, and then workers, that whole section. I remember just seeing just the burden on his face, like physically, you could see the burden. I remember especially the husband sermon. He was like, man, I, I'm... <laughs> I'm trying to be the best husband I can be. I'm, I'm, I'm so convicted by this. I, I want to grow. I want to be better. I want to do that. And I hope every husband in this church would do the same. I, I'm struggling to apply this to my life. Man, if they would do that too, we would see our church just go new levels. If every husband loved their wife as Christ loved the church, Ephesians 5, man, this church would be a different place. If every husband loved their, their kids the, the way that the Bible calls them to, man, this church would be a different place. And then wives, man, they would be able to submit to their husbands. And this would be a, just an incredible experience if husbands would love their wives the way that Colossians, the way that Ephesians calls them to. I remember just seeing the burden on his face, the care for his sheep. See, every week, he, he will step up here, and every week that I'm up here, I step up the, the same way of, man, if the church would hear this, they would understand it, and they would be able to put it into practice. How awesome would that be? I, I've never preached a sermon. I don't believe he's ever preached a sermon where it's just like, eh, eh, maybe. I'm not like hype about it, but I hope they do it. You know, whatever. No, it's, man, God's word is transformative. It is the implanted word which is able to save souls. Man, I, it's changing my life. I hope it changes their life. I'm praying that it changes their life, their life too. See, at Compass, we, we, we try to 
preach as applicationally as possible. Not in a place where we're divorcing like application or self-help from the exegesis of the text. Not going full, you know, celebrity pastor mode, you know, seeker sensitive mode, but trying to root the application of God's word in, in, in the text. If you even think about the, the way that we word the points, I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but you look at the points, they're always imperatives. Have you noticed that? They're always second person imperatives. Do this, avoid this, be encouraged by this, treat one another like this. It's always, hey, God's word says this, you need to do that. See, Bible has the power to change our life. The Bible has power to change your life, yet oftentimes it doesn't even change your Sunday afternoon. Why is that? Why is that? God's word, it is so transformative if we, if we hear and then we take that into practice and we do. He started Romans uh, next week. And I just, I think about, first of all, how long Romans is and how long we're going to be in Romans. But I think, man, by the end of this Roman series, I, I, I want to pray that I would look like a different person. I want to pray that I look so much more holy than I do now. I want to pray that I've, I, I, I've got all this fruit in my life that I can look back on and say, wow, the Bible has transformed my life. And I hope you have that same desire as we open up to a new, a brand new series that we can look back and say, wow, I see tangible maturity in my life because I was a hearer and I was a doer. One of the questions last week um, in the small group, uh, small group questions, I think it was question number one, um, it said, how have you grown throughout the uh, book of Colossians? And maybe you had small groups this week, and maybe you had to think about that question for longer than two seconds. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, how, how have I grown? And hopefully after two seconds, you're able to point to a few things like, oh, I did this, man, I, I can see more encouragement here. I can see a greater reliance on prayer there. I'm being a better husband or wife here or there that those two seconds were somewhat problematic, right? Like, we should get to the end of Romans where it's like, boom, I don't even need two seconds to think about it because look at my life as a completely different person because I'm a hearer and I'm a doer. Again, I don't know how long we're going to be in Romans. It's 16 long chapters, and by the time we get to the end, greet one another with a holy kiss. I'm excited to see what the application point will be there. But I hope that I and you have all applied God's word increasingly, bearing increasing fruit, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, because the transforming power of God's word. One of Moses' famous, or famous, one of Moses, or famous too, one of his favorite words throughout the, the, first, five books of the um, first five books of the Old Testament is remember. He says that word over and over and over and over again. Why? Because the people were so forgetful. You think about the wilderness generation, I mean, we, we read numbers and Deuteronomy and we're like, what are you guys doing? What are you doing? Why are you you're forgetting this and this and this? Moses constantly, hey guys, remember. Hey guys, remember. Hey guys, remember. And that's probably how I see this sermon. It's a, it's a, hey guys, remember. Let's make sure that we are responding the right way to God's word. Not being hearers, not being just spectators, but swiftly obeying God's word. Look back at verse 25. So we've got this man who forgets after looking at the mirror. And we've got this man who doesn't forget. Verse 25, the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. James says, instead of forgetting, be someone that is swiftly obeying. I love the way that he ends it. He will be blessed in his doing, not monetarily, not successfully, but blessed in terms of he will be growing. He will be bearing fruit. He will be reaping righteousness because he's swiftly obeying and not forgetting God's word. So write it down this way for point number two. Reap righteousness with swift obedience. Reap righteousness with swift obedience. And in one sense, you write that down, you think, duh, like, of course, Obeying God equals righteousness. But I want us to think about it in terms of hearing and doing. There's a promise here of, of blessed, in, in this guy who's blessed in his doing because he's looking into the perfect law, law of liberty, persevering, not forgetting, but a doer who acts, there will be blessing, there will be righteousness, there will be fruit that will tangibly be there for someone who hears and does. You see, 
sanctification is so hard. Growing in godliness, growing in holiness is so hard. The Bible talks about that all over the place. So many, so many analogies, so many metaphors to athletes and farmers and soldiers and all these like really hard, gritty illustrations. Because it's hard. It is gritty. It, it is difficult to be a Christian. We, we, we see this in um, Philippians chapter 2. You can write down Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Another familiar text. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with, not apathy, trying a little bit harder, doing a little bit better. Just try to work it out. No, he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is, a, this is a team effort in terms of growth. Team effort in terms of you are putting in strenuous energy and effort to grow in godliness, but then God is also the one who, to, to, who works to, in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Maybe you're sitting here and you're like, I'm not growing that much. Colossians, I didn't really grow at all. Maybe, one, you're the self-deceived here, but maybe, not, maybe, maybe you're, just, you're just not doing, you're not putting in any effort. You see, to grow in godliness, you need both this idea of grit and then you also need this idea of grace where, where we have the Holy Spirit working within us, asking God to transform our heart. But then there's also this aspect of it requires energy. It requires effort. You think about all these like, famous athletes that have kids and their kids go on to be successful athletes as well. You think of all the juniors, if you will, like the Ken Griffey Jr. or Vladimir Guerrero Jr., or all these people whose dad was in the NBA or in the MLB or something like that. All of these kids, they, they be, not all of them, obviously, but a lot, of, they become successful. Why? Well, on, in one sense, they've received this, this gene, the, the, the genes to, to be this athlete, right? To be built in a certain way, to be strong, to be tall, to have these, you know, certain uh, fine-tuned motor skills. But then also on the other side, Ken Griffey Jr., Vladimir Guerrero Jr., all the juniors, they actually worked. They put in the effort as well. Yeah, were they given this incredible uh, set of athletic genes? Yes, they were. And that was nothing that they earned. They just received it just by being born. But then on the other side, they put, they put in the effort. And you need this both to have a successful junior. It is, we've got the genes, which I just received, and then we've got the hard work that, that is required as well. Again, requiring effort. We see the one right here in verse 25 who looks into the perfect law. Verse 23, it has this idea of this man looking intently. These are two different words, but both of them have this idea of peering. Peering into. The, the, word, the word, uh, in verse 25, the word that is translated looks there, it's this idea of like bending down to like look very carefully. Like with a magnifying glass kind of thing. Like looking down to check it out. You see, when we show up on a Sunday morning, when you show up and open up your Bible, um, you know, early in the morning or something like that, whenever you do your uh, daily quiet time, we open it up and we peer into it. We look with, with, with strenuous effort. We gaze, we stoop down to look at. It's more than just a superficial look. Oh, I'm going to show up. I'm already mad at my kids for making me late. And I, I you know, waltzed in three songs into the set. I'm huffing and puffing. I'm frustrated at my wife. I'm, you know, thinking about what I'm going to eat for lunch later this afternoon. I'm thinking about my football team. How's my fantasy football team doing? Like, you think about all these different things. That's the, 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 the glancing, just looking at it and like looking away. This idea of peering into, looking down, bending down to make sure that I can be a doer because I was a good hearer to start off with. Again, you can't apply God's word unless you hear well. Being a hearer is in one sense, a bad thing if you're a hearer only, but being a hearer is a great thing. You need to be a hearer so that you can be a doer. We think about when you, when you open up God's word, we need to be thinking in terms of, man, I, I just peered into the perfect law, the law of liberty. What, 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 what can I do? How can I apply this to my life? And hopefully you have that discipline in your own quiet time where you're reading it and you're, man, I, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. Today, I, I need to really work on it. God, help me do this. Please help me. And hopefully you have that habit. But also that habit should translate to a Sunday morning <laughs> on your drive to church praying, hey God, help me grow. I'm sure on the drive home, you ask your kids, hey, what'd you learn in Sunday school? Well, how about we flip the script a little bit. Kids tell you what they learned in Sunday school and you tell them what, what you learned as well. Man, I, I, I want to do this and this. Mom and dad, man, we're not, we're, we're not doing this. And you talked about evangelism. We need to find ways as a family to, to go out and share the gospel. 
when we're talking to your kids, talking to your spouse, so that by the time you show up to lunch on Sunday after church, you haven't already forgotten about it, but you're talking about it. You're doing what Moses says, remember, 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 being a good hearer so that you can be a doer. You see, this is why small groups is so important. Small groups is like that other like, foundational column to, 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 to keep the, the structure together. Small groups, what is it? It's a reinforcement of the sermon. If you're in a small group, we go through questions, not of random stuff. We go through questions about the sermon. What did we learn? Read the same verses again. Pull out your worksheet. Fill out the questions. Man, preacher said this. The Bible says this. I should, I should put this into practice. So if you're not committed to your small group, I would ask you, you know, what are you doing? Be committed. Be committed because it's the hearing and the doing. Again, can you do on your own? You can. But doing in a community of other doers is so much more successful. It's so much better. You will find so much more success if you do the doing with one another, especially in a small group setting. The mirror is so instructive to tell us what to do. It's our job now to respond in obedience. He sees, I love the way that he describes the word. He calls it a perfect law and a law of liberty. Again, I mentioned it earlier, but the Bible, not only is it the mirror that shows us where we fall short, like when you look at a mirror on a Sunday morning before you show up to church, but it, it also does provide the solution, the perfect law, the law of liberty. The idea of liberty, what is that? Synonym, freedom? You think Romans chapter 6, being a slave to sin, now you've been freed and now you're a slave to God, a slave to righteousness? There's freedom in that. John chapter 8, uh, verse 34 and 36, he says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The Bible, it gives us, it, God reveals himself through the pages of the scripture to show us our sinfulness and then to show us our need for salvation and then to give us salvation through the life, death, and resurrection of his Son. The only way you're going to reap righteousness is if you have that freedom from God and using the Bible for its intended purpose. Like we said, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness. The Bible has an intended purpose. You've got a lot of things in your life that have intended purposes that you don't use them in non-intended purposes, right? I've got, I've got an iPad here, and Tim Cook made me this iPad, and he designed the iPad to do what an iPad's supposed to do. It's a screen. I can preach from it. I can read on it. I can watch a YouTube video on it. But if I was going home today and trying to make some lunch, I'm not going to throw my iPad on the stove and just start cooking some meat on it. Why? Because that's not what the iPad was intended for. You say, hey, man, like, let's go play some baseball. And I say, okay, well, I'm bringing my iPad. We're going to play some baseball. I'm going to swing, and I'm going to hit the baseball with my iPad. No, I don't. I've got a different tool that does that job. We've got a tool on your phone, in your lap right now. Are you using it for its intended purpose? Teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness perfect law, the law of liberty, sufficient, complete. We see the response here, a response of perseverance. Perseverance is this, as, this aspect of remaining and staying and patient, <laughs> remaining under a, a heavy load. Think of Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. If you don't have this one memorized, I would challenge you to memorize it this week. Galatians 6, 9. It says, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season you will reap if you do not give up. This aspect of perseverance and godliness. Perseverance in doing, hearing and doing. Jesus gives us a great picture of remaining. John chapter 15, you, turn, you can turn over there with me. He calls himself the, the vine, the true vine. John 15, look at verse 4. Down to verse 8, Jesus says, you need to endure, you need to persevere, you need to remain. Our ESV translators translates it, you need to abide in me. John 15, verse 4, he says, abide in me, remain, endure, persevere in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. Branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. 
By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Again, Jesus gives this promise of blessing, this promise of growth, this promise of a harvest, a reaping of righteousness, of fruit. By actively putting it on. <laughs> Think about the concept of the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 20 through 24 there. Fruit of the Spirit. Fruit, what are the fruit of the Spirit? They are gifts in terms of the Spirit is giving you love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all these things. But then these are also things that you, again, have to actively put on yourself. It's hard to love. It's hard to be joyful. It's hard to be kind. It's hard to have peace. All of these different things. Hard to be patient. All these different fruit of the Spirit. Again, we see that picture of abiding in terms of remaining in Christ to have the grace sufficient to obey Him, but then also the aspect of of putting it on ourselves. The response, the perseverance, the abiding, the remaining, the continuing to pay attention to, the not forgetting. See, I want to continue to grow. I hope you do as well as we just kind of have this one weird Sunday between two giant series of Colossians and then Romans. My prayer for myself, my prayer for you is that we all look different by the end of Romans, that we all bear so much fruit, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. The only way that we, 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 we do that is if we hear and do. You guys are doing the Minor Prophets right now in uh, Dwell Richly. I'm excited about that. Uh, one of my favorite Minor Prophets, actually, is the two-chapter Minor Prophet of Haggai. If you know the story of Haggai, Haggai was one of the three post-exilic Minor Prophets that were uh, writing to the people of Israel after they've come back from Babylon, after they've been deported. They come back, and Haggai, he shows up on the scene, and they've got the temple there that was destroyed by Babylon, and it's still destroyed. It's still sitting there in ruins. And Haggai says, you guys left the temple of God, God's house, and you went and you went and made your own house. It describes, it says, God's house is in ruins while your house, you're living in paneled houses, he says. You've, you've decked it out. You've customized it. You've gone full like HGTV, like they're shiplap, I guess, in a, certain, in a way. They're, they were living in these shiplap homes while God's house was in ruins. And Haggai, he shows up on their doorstep and he says this phrase. He says it a couple times. Haggai chapter 1, he says, consider your ways. Consider your ways. Look in the mirror. What are you doing? God's house is in ruins, and you're living in a paneled house. That's messed up. And he says, consider your ways. And I love Haggai because he shows up. He's bold. He calls them to repentance. And then what do the people do? They repent. They say, okay, enough with my house. I'm going to go fix God's house. And they do. And God blesses them for that. God, he like laid out the path for them to do it. God pretty much did all the work. They had the grit, but God gave them the grace to do it. He, he had uh, King Cyrus of Persia give him some funding. He had the next king come and give him some funding. Like they, God provided over and abundantly for them. All they did was repent. After Haggai said, consider your ways. And I think what, what a timely message for us right now between these two series. Let us consider our ways. Let us make sure that we are not just hearers, but we are also doers so that we see more and more fruit born in our life each and every week throughout this next series. Let's consider our ways. Let's be doers of the word. Let's bow our heads and let's pray right now. God, we are just such uh, unworthy recipients of Um, Not only your grace, but also your grace to give us your word. God, you did not need to reveal yourself to us. God, we deserve nothing but condemnation for our sin. But God, you stepped into time and space, not only to send your son to forgive us of sin, but you've also stepped into time and space, revealing yourself through the pages of scripture. And God, we have this book in our laps that we can be 100% confident in knowing that these are your very words, inspired, breathed out by you. And God, we are so grateful for it. And God, we confess that oftentimes we are just hearers of the word. God, we've walked away from so many sermons, so many times of of, of prayer and reading in our Bibles. We've walked away and we've looked the same as the way that we walked in. And God, we confess that. God, we hate that. We don't want that. We want to turn. We want to consider our ways God, thank you for this reminder. And God, as we look forward to 
X amount of weeks in the book of Romans, God, I just pray that you would bear much fruit in each of our lives. God, you would use even the gift of small groups coming together to reinforce, to remember what we've learned. God, we would take theology and we put it into practice on Thursday. We would take the truths of Scripture and we would throw legs on it. We would do it. God, help us. This is hard. This is difficult. It takes a lot of strenuous effort. So God, please provide the, the grace and the strength and the endurance to persevere, to not grow weary of doing, of doing good, because, God, we know it is a promise that in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Help us. God, thank you for this reminder. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.